In the dark, grim setting that Warhammer Fantasy is, you wouldn't expect to find much romance in it. Today, I'm going to try and disprove that theory by showing you one of the greatest pairs in the entirety of Games Workshop's fiction. No, I'm not talking about your traditional romance between Tyrion and Elariel, nor am I going on about the incredibly weird thing Marathi and Malekith have got going on. Actually, now that you mention it, I could have just paired Marathi up with practically anyone in the setting. No, I'm not talking about any of that icky, gross, lovey-dovey stuff, my friends. I'm instead referring to the love between bros. A bromance between a lich and a white, the everlasting bond between Heinrich Kemmler and Krell. Heinrich Kemmler was not always the mad, wrinkled old man you see him as today. Once, he was just a young man with big dreams. His exact origins are quite shadowy, but many know that in his earlier years, Heinrich decided that life wasn't fair. Or, I suppose he realised the idea of death wasn't fair, and so he sought to prolong his own life by any means necessary and become immortal. It's not exactly the level of success most people are aiming for, but why not shoot for the moon, right? As a young man, Heinrich turned towards the ways of necromancy to accomplish his goals, and by the time he was 40, he could raise full graveyards of corpses to serve under his command. Heinrich proved to be a necromantic prodigy, and because necromancy is seen as a predominantly evil magic in Warhammer, the only thing he could do with his new magical prowess was to turn it against his rivals and the general civilian population. Heinrich Kemmler's great rise to power began when he journeyed to ancient Nehakara, the land of the Tomb Kings and probably the best place to learn about necromancy in the world as it was once home to Nagash. While a lot of Tomb Kings refrained from speaking to outsider necromancers, Heinrich did manage to treat with some skeleton boys and learn a great deal about bringing the dead back to life. He brought these secrets back with him to wreak havoc on the old world. Heinrich didn't just have magical knowledge to power his necromantic efforts, mind you, and he also brought somewhat of an arsenal of artefacts to aid him as well. He dove into many dungeons looking for prized magical items over his long life, basically making him a mad old Indiana Jones, or just Indy from the later movies. Heinrich is often armed with the Chaos Tomb Blade, a sword that, as the name would suggest, came from a Chaos Tomb. The Tomb Blade allows Heinrich to entrap the souls of any enemy he kills within the sword while buffing him up with dark energy. In his left hand, he carries the Skull Staff, which again is aptly named as it is a staff that ends in a skull. It also whispers sweet nothings to Heinrich at all times, warning him of any potential magic attack and filling him in on the latest undead drama. Finally, Heinrich drapes himself in the cloak of mist and shadows, which gives him a suitably spooky appearance while also hiding all the cuts, scars and abrasions decorating his naked flesh. With his epic loot and knowledge, Heinrich founded a club of like-minded necromancers to help devastate the old world. With Heinrich being the new kid on the scene, this offended the local necroarch, Bracknar the Damned, who formed his own Council of Nine and set out to destroy Mr. Gemmler and his associates. A great conflict was fought across Estalia, with the local militias mostly helpless to stop the warring undead factions in their lands. The conflict lasted many years, eventually ending with Heinrich's total victory and Bracknar going into exile. Years later, Bracknar again tried to thwart Heinrich, but he ended up being turned to dust by our mad boy. Bracknar wasn't the only rival in Heinrich's long life, and soon after finishing off the Necrarch, Kemmler found himself captured by the Lich Crovan while searching for one of the books of Nagash. Kemmler was kept in Crovan's dungeon for five years, which on the whole wasn't great for his mental health, but it was a good thing for his reputation, as after he found a way to break free, Heinrich killed Crovan and earned himself the title of Lichmaster. This title didn't really give Heinrich any powers, but it does sound cool. This gave Heinrich the foundation of his strength and over the next 20 years he built himself further, gaining a fortress in the vaults and being a menace to Tilia and Bretonia. Bretonia proved to be quite the challenge for Heinrich though, as the Knights of the Lady weren't ones to be messed with. While the undead might have given Heinrich a lot of power to raid Bretonia with at first, over time the chivalrous Frenchies found a way to fight back, eventually granting Heinrich a crushing defeat, which caused him to flee his fortress. Without his bony boys and any sort of base of operations, Heinrich was consumed by madness, wandering the border princes and grey mountains in search of something, anything that could restore his power and his former glory. Just when things seemed at their worst, Heinrich stumbled upon an old barrow tomb, finding an ancient warrior within, a warrior known as Krell. Krell was once a Chaos Lord, at the head of a Norsecan warband that had come under the influence of the blood god Khorne. He was a strong and mighty warrior who wreaked havoc across the Old World, long before the days of Sigmar. 
he carved out his own empire in the lands and set his sights on the Dwarven Kingdoms next, siding with nearby night goblin tribes to sack the great halls of Karak Ungor and Karak Varn. His name is recorded in the Great Book of Grudges for the hatred the Dwarven peoples still have for him. Krell's reign of terror wasn't a permanent one, as during an attack on Karak Kadrin, he was slain by a great Dwarven warrior. This would be Krell's first death, and he was carried back to a great tomb by his men. Around 1500 years later, Krell's body was discovered by Nagash, who was searching for the crown of sorcery at the time. Seeing Krell was a great warrior of old, Nagash raised him, and the White became one of Nagash's nine Dark Lords, being summoned to lead the legions of undead at the Necromancer's command. Krell led the vanguard of Nagash's armies, once again falling into that role of the unstoppable killing machine on a battlefield. Against an emerging Sigmar, Krell was brought forth to lead Nagash's armies once more, allowing him to kill some dwarves who had sided with the man who would become a god. In the battle against Sigmar, Krell's role was to break the dwarven front line. He nearly completed that job, and probably would have done so were it not for his master being cut down by Sigmar further along the battlefield. Krell's men were the only survivors of this great loss, but because the humans had taken such heavy casualties, they couldn't pursue him for some time. This meant that Krell could cut a bloody swath through the old world, pillaging settlements and ensuring that even hundreds of years on, humans would not be quick to forget his name. However, Krell's happy fun murder time couldn't last forever, and he was brought down by Sigmar at the Battle of Glacier Lake. His body was left imprisoned in a magical tomb, left to be found centuries later by one Heinrich Kemmler. Heinrich and Krell were immediately a great match. The former had all the magic ability, while the latter provided some much needed muscle, or just bone. They were an iconic duo, tearing through the old world, reinvigorated, and wanting to claim as much power for themselves as possible. They were nigh inseparable, and are some of the best bros in Warhammer Fantasy. Though they had a lot of history before their meeting, it does seem strange to think of one without the other by their side. Beyond just hanging out, the two proved to be a powerful villainous combination in Warhammer Fantasy as well, as with Krell by his side, Heinrich was able to make a much better go of his attacks on Bretonia, raiding La Mesenthal Abbey with a new army of undead. Also, they proved to be a great pest to the Wood Elves of Athel Lauren, often choosing to attack the Great Forest in the winter when the elves and trees were far too cold to protect their lands properly. Although, like the Warhammer Fantasy setting itself, Heinrich and Krell's escapades couldn't last forever, and they found their final moments together in the End Times. The End Times is a huge event I've referenced quite a lot, and it begins in proper with the resurrection of Nagash, which is the focus of the first novel in the End Times series. Nagash's long-time servant Arkan the Black is looking to take advantage of the weakness of the humans, elves, and dwarves, and bring his master back to life. Or undeath, I suppose. During this effort, Arkan linked up with our boy Heinrich, hoping that the Lich Master would want to serve Nagash. This led the two and Krell to raid La Mesenthal Abbey once more in the search of an artifact that could bring Nagash back. However, just as victory was assured, Heinrich turned his back on Nagash and went into business for himself, leading to a duel between the Lich Master and Arkan. Sadly, Heinrich lost that duel and was killed. Krell was then taken over by Arkan, left without his best buddy to fight until the world ended around them. Heinrich, Kemmler and Krell's tale is a tragic one, but it reminds us to treasure the times with our bros as we won't have them forever. I do hope you've enjoyed this one, and I just want to give out one more huge thank you to everyone who's liking, commenting, stuff like that, and um, giving out the support. I've been at this for a while, and getting this sort of traction just feels unreal. But yeah, signing out for now. See you soon.